And so begins our adventures with the flipped classroom. Um, perhaps not as entertaining or comfortable as the uh, having lectures in class, but it frees up space for us to do other important things in class. And I am convinced that it is a much more engaged and effective uh, bit of learning that we do with the flipped classroom. I hope you will agree with me. At any rate, today's lecture is on vector arithmetic, but um, we start with a few more problems from our study of uh, kinematics that we did yesterday. And, and uh, um, here you have checkpoint three. Uh, this is from your textbook if you want to uh, see it there, although it doesn't come with the multiple choice options in the textbook that I have added here. Um, but um, that uh, you are to, to read it carefully and for each of these scenarios A, B, C, and D listed up here you choose whether the uh, value is negative, zero, or positive. And then move on to the next which is another checkpoint. Again, please read through the checkpoint, think about the checkpoint, answer the checkpoint, and go on to the next checkpoint. Um, and do likewise. All right, now to vectors. Um, and and uh, what is something that is not a vector? And the class responds, Scalars are things that are not vectors, but coefficients are also things that are not vectors. Remember that a vector is something which has size and direction. A scalar is something that only has size, no direction, and a coefficient is something which has neither size nor direction. Uh, one very familiar coefficient was the coefficient of friction, which was the ratio of two forces, the frictional force and the normal force. And as a ratio, it ends up dimensionless. And that is the reason why we say it does not have size, and we call it a coefficient. That's really trivia. Vector and scalar, you need to own those. This is just trivia, the word coefficient. And then the book gives you this picture. And uh, this is, of course, a familiar head to tail addition of vectors to get the uh, resultant vector here in bold and black. But what property of vector addition is being illustrated by this picture? And I hope that you very quickly are able to tell me that this is showing commutivity that it doesn't matter whether you add the blue vector first and the red second or the red vector first and the blue second, you get the same result. So changing the order, commuting, does not affect the vector addition. What about this picture? What is being illustrated here? Here we are adding three vectors together. And these goofy little dotted vectors in here, what's up with that? And I hope you can tell me that this is illustrating associativity. That if you add the blue and red vectors together first to get this magenta dotted, and then add on the third vector, you get exactly the same result as if you add the red and magenta together, getting this blue dotted vector, and then add on the blue. So the associating of blue with red or red with magenta does not change the result. This uh, commutivity especially, but both of these are properties that you have to have if you're going to be a vector. Your addition has to be commutative and associative. And I will show you an example in class that you may remember from last year that there are things 
which seem very vector-like, very sized and directional, but the order in which you add them changes the result and so we say they are not vectors because they do not have commutivity. All right, I hope you recognize this as a experience from last year and many times in math that here we are taking vector A and breaking it into components. One parallel to the x-axis and one parallel to the y-axis. And I would expect you to be able to tell me with very little effort that the size of this x component is equal to the magnitude, oops, the magnitude of the vector times the cosine of theta and that the size of the y component is the magnitude times the sine of theta. And this needs to be something that is second nature to you. If you struggled with this idea last year, then you need to practice, practice, practice until it is second nature. That this vector is a sine theta and similarly. Um, needs to happen right away. And vice versa. If you are given the components. You need to be able to get the magnitude of the resultant, the thing they add up to. And you do it by Pythagorean addition. And if you are given the components, you need to be able to get theta. Theta is the angle whose tangent is this opposite over this adjacent. Bingo. But this needs to be second nature. You need to do this without any effort you need to be surprised if that's not obvious to the people you are chatting with over lunch. Now we are going to move on into unit vectors, which was not something that was emphasized last year. And I think you will find is a very useful approach to dealing with vectors this year. So we start with these three vectors, i, j, and k, which are our unit vectors that in the positive x direction, we have a vector whose magnitude is 1, hence unit. We call that i, and in the positive y, of length 1, the unit vector j, and in the positive z, we have the vector of length 1, which we call k, unit vector k. Notice this hand here with the first, the thumb and the first two fingers laid out mutually orthogonal to one another. This makes a right hand coordinate system. And that is where we do our arithmetic. If you did this with your left hand, then you would get a mirror image of this coordinate system. Um, if, if i and j were pointing as indicated, k would go off in the opposite direction. That's not good. You be sure to remember to use your right hand when establishing the direction of i, j, and k. All right, so I want to add these two vectors together using unit vectors. And I could just take the, the blue vector, which is at, at 120, and the magenta vector, which is at negative 53, and I could get the angle in between, and I could use the law of cosines to get the magnitude of their addition. Oh, I would want to put them head to tail first and then get the angle between here. But I don't want to do it that way. You could do it that way, but I think learning unit vectors is going to be very valuable. So what you're going to do is take the vector of magnitude 10 and break it into vectors in the i and the j direction, in the x and the y direction. And so this, and, and note that I don't have to worry about the fact that this angle here is 60 and that that's going in the negative direction and that's going in the positive direction. If I just take 10 cos 120 my calculator will give me a negative value for the cosine of 120, and my calculator will give me a positive value for the cosine of 120, the sine of 120, 
and everything will come out wonderfully. So you just take this magnitude times the cosine of negative 53 and this magnitude times the sine of negative 53. This is in the I direction. That's in the J direction. Uh, let your calculator do the work for you. And, and you have um, the negative 5 and the positive 8.7 to 2 sig figs and the negative 9 and the uh, negative 12 to 2 sig figs. Then, having gotten your calculator to do this for you, it's very easy to add the two i parts together. Negative 5 and 9 get you a 4, and 8.7 and negative 12 gets you this negative 3.3 in the i and the j directions. And this would be a good place to leave the answer if, if, uh, if they were asking you what the sum of those two vectors was. This would be a good answer unless the problem explicitly or implicitly implies that the answer ought to be given in this magnitude direction form as opposed to in unit vectors, in which case you would put them back together. You would do a Pythagorean addition of 4 and 3.3 and then you would take the inverse tangent of negative 3.3 over 4. Be sure you get it in the right quadrant. Um, and, and you would be done with that problem. It is worth the effort. It will make things go better. Now we're going to move on from vector addition to vector multiplication. And the first vector multiplication we will do is known as a dot also known as the scalar product. And the example you had of this, this is um, when you do this, you are only interested in the multiplying the parallel components together. Perpendicular components do not have any contribution. The example of this from last year was when you were calculating work. And only the force that was parallel to the distance moved did work. Um, that the way you get the component parallel is to take the angle between these two vectors. They need to be tail to tail. And you find the angle between them, take the cosine of that angle, and that will give you only the parallel component, either the parallel component of f or the parallel component of d. doesn't matter. The dot product is equal to fd cos theta. Suppose the two vectors, suppose the force was 36 newtons at 56.3, and the uh, distance moved was 5.1 at 11.3 degrees. We're going to take the dot product of these two. Well, you could go back and, and uh, probably sketch those two vectors, find out what the angle between them was, and, and put your 3.6 and the 5.1 and the cosine of that angle into here and do that problem. But I think it will be valuable for you to do it with uh, unit vectors. You can probably decide unless the problem forces you to do it in unit vectors. But let's just very quickly, your calculator would give you that 3.6 times the cosine of 56.3 is 2.0. And 3.6 times the sine of 56.3 is 3.0 in the i and the j direction. And similarly here, you get the i and the j. And then you take the dot product, which is a distribution. You do 20 i, 2 i times 5 i and 2 i dot 1 j and 3 j dot 5 i and 3j dot 1j. But remember that it is only the parallel components that add up to anything, multiply up to anything. And so this i dot j being perpendicular, that's going to be a 0. And similarly here. And so you end up with um, 2.5 is a 10. Notice it has no direction. This is a scalar product. 
the result does not have any direction. And 3 times 1 is 3, and so you get 13 for your result. Which would also be the case if you did do 3.6 times 5.1 times the cosine of the angle between those two, which is 45. Well, that should be comforting to know that this works. Maybe you think that would have been faster, but this is a good skill to have. Dot products. On to cross products, otherwise known as scalar products. And this time, we are only interested in the perpendicular components. That is all we are going to multiply together. And you ran into this last year when you dealt with torques that, that uh, when you took an arm, crossed the force to get the amount of twisting force that was there. It was only the perpendicular component that mattered. Again, you needed to put the two vectors tail to tail and then take the sine of the angle between them, which gives you the perpendicular component either of R or of F. But now we're going to do it with, with uh, dot products. I mean, sorry. Now we're going to do it with unit vectors. And when, when we get into unit vectors, we're going to need to have this image to support our work. That this cross product multiplication is a matter of a right hand rule that you take your fingers of your right hand and you point them in the direction of the first vector and then orient your hand, twist your wrist until you can wrap your fingers into the direction of the second vector and your thumb then points in the direction of their product. So I cross J gets you positive K. J cross K gets you positive I. But if you go the opposite direction, if you go J to I against the alphabet, then your thumb is pointing off here in the negative K direction. So if you go forwards in the alphabet from I to J or from J to K, or this is sort of modular, K to I is also forwards in the alphabet, then you get the <coughs> other vector you know, if it's K and I, then you get J is the result. And if you've gone forward, then you get a positive J. And if you've gone backwards, then you get a negative J. You really need to be careful about that. And so, if we are taking the cross product of these two vectors, which is very lengthy to write out, but I do need to be careful about my distributing and I need to be very careful about the order that a cross product is not commutative. You must put the first vector first. So it has to be 2i cross 5i. It matters the order. 2i cross j, 2i cross 4k, 3j cro cross 5i, 3j cross j, 3j cross 4k. Take the time to write it out. I'm going to show you another technique to avoid careless errors, but if you do not write this out and you do not use that other technique, you are very likely to make careless errors. Take your time. Be careful. Now, in this list, I cross I, well, I is completely parallel to I. So I'm going to get nothing out of that cross product. And similarly with J cross J. But for the other parts, the, the I cross J is forwards in the alphabet, so that's a positive K. I cross K is backwards in the alphabet. So that's a negative J times 8. This is going to J to I is backwards in the alphabet, so that's a negative K times 15. And J cross K is forwards in the alphabet, so that's a positive I times 12. 
Then we put the two k terms together and here is the cross product of these two vectors. I don't think you would want to do this any other way than using unit vectors. You would not want to use magnitude and angle and, and try to do a cross product. But here is the alternative. For that same set of two vectors that we were looking at before, instead of writing it all out as we did, which was fine, it just takes a little longer and it's a little prone to careless mistakes, you can instead make a determinant with the first row being the ijk and the second row being the components of the first vector. Very important that the first vector be in this location and here are the components of the second vector. If you switch the order, it's going to make it be a, the negative of the result. And then what you do is find the determinant of this matrix. Start with i, which is in the first row, first column. 1 plus 1 is 2. So this is in an even position. That's going to be a positive. i times the determinant of this submatrix here, which is plus in this direction, plus 12, minus 0. And so you get 12i. And then we have the J, which is in the first row, second column. 1 plus 2 adds up to 3. This is in an odd position. So it's going to be a negative when I find the determinant. And then its co-matrix is this 2 times 4, always plus in this direction, minus 0 times 5. So it's, it's 8 minus 0 but it's a negative because j was in an odd position. So negative 8j. And then we have the k, which is in the first row, third column. 1 plus 3 is 4. That's in an even position. So it's going to be positive times 2 minus 15. So you get this negative 13k. I think you'll find this will be much less prone to error. All right, so I want you to practice this, this matter of, of uh, um, vector multiplication. And first, we're going to do the cross product the way I said you shouldn't. And that is to take these two magnitudes and multiply them together, and then the sign of the angle between them. Well, if you put these two vectors both starting at the origin, then, then the angle between them would be 65, no, yes, 65, or is it negative 65? Yes, be sure you wrap from this one into this one, which would be positive 65. Okay, you do that get an answer. And then break these into unit vectors and it, you, you don't really have a, a um, you're just going to have i and j because I'm trying to make it easy on you. And so break these into their unit vectors and then uh, write that and then do the cross product and remember this going forwards in that modular alphabet gets you a positive and going backwards in the alphabet gets you a negative. Do that. And then finally, make the matrix and, and find its determinant to get the answer. And you should get the same answer all three ways. And I just want you to confirm that for yourself. Finally, um, I would like to point out what I think is a cute approach. And that is, suppose they gave you these two vectors and said, what is the angle between them? Suppose it was in three dimensions. Suppose there was a k term in both of these, or at least one of them. And they asked you to find the angle between those two vectors. How much nicer to find the dot product, very easy for you to do. And then here, 
use Pythagoras to get the magnitude of that one. What's that? The square root of 13. And the magnitude of this one, the square root of 26. And this value will be known. A and B will be known. And so theta will be the only unknown. What a cute way to find the angle between two vectors. And I want you to be cute. Cute is lovable. And you should do lovable physics. Have a good day and I'll see you tomorrow.